Hello everybody, my name is Connor Joyce, and today I'll be talking about automation. This is the Night King, the leader of the White Walkers. For those of you who are Game of Thrones fans, you probably know who this is. But for those of you who are not, the White Walkers are the main force in Game of Thrones, the main enemy. And I think automation is similar to White Walkers for two reasons. The first of all is that they're this force that looms above everyone, and while the different factions compete over resources, the White Walkers are there ready to pounce and, and change the world. It's also, they're also similar because when people, some factions don't believe that the White Walkers exist. They, they might exist, they might not, but as soon as they see them or they are impacted by them, instantly they realize they do exist and they realize the power that they have. So when I say automation, some different images may come to mind. And you might think of something like this, or for some, they may think of something like this. If you keep current with the news, you'll think of something like this. But in reality, a lot of automation is just this. So when the experts look at automation, they, uh, or I should say, when this whole conversation around automation started with two English economists who published a paper in 2013 that predicted 47% of jobs would be automated in the near future. And since then, there's been a lot of predictions that have been made about how automation will impact the workforce. And you can see they vary significantly. You have some that are suggesting a lot of impact, others that are not. But what I find fascinating is the times like at 2025, where you have two predictions at the same year that differ by over 21 million. When we look at the worldwide automation, it's even larger. We have Thomas Frey, who was one of the economists that had published the original paper, predicting two billion jobs by 2030, where you have a McKinsey study suggesting 1.4 billion less jobs being automated. The reason that these automation predictions are different is because there's three main approaches that the experts have taken. There's the occupation, the tasks, and the skill-based approach, all of which I'll quickly cover. So the first is occupation-based approach, and that is what Thomas Frey and Michael Osborne took in that, that 2013 paper. And what they did was they took jobs and they placed them in an occupation categories. And then they had experts subjectively gauge which of the two, or which of the jobs were likely to be automated. They equated automation to outsourcing in some ways here. Either a job existed or it could be outsourced, but instead of being outsourced to another country, it was being outsourced to a non-human entity, a robot. And what this means is that they looked at jobs as being binary. Either they existed or they would be automated. So the pros of this approach is it's simple to calculate. All you need are experts that understand automation and the impact it can have. But the withdrawals are that A, it's subjective, and that B, it doesn't capture the differences between individual jobs. So then we have the task-based approach, which the task-based approach is what most of the studies that have come out throughout the past couple of years have taken. And here they take occupations and they break it down into a subset of tasks. And then they categorize those tasks. And they'll use a framework similar to this one, which was uh, created by David Otter at MIT. And he broke down tasks into a two-by-two two matrix based on physical versus cognitive and routine versus non-routine. The most highly automatable are the physical routine tasks. Think about an assembly line. Those jobs have been automated for the last couple of decades, and there's no reason to believe they won't be automated going forward. But on the flip side, you have cognitive non-routine tasks. And cognitive non-routine tasks, the best, what I like to think about is an ad agency. They're creating something brand new using their mind and their creative skills to be able to develop a new ad campaign. And those, those tasks are much less automatable. So once they have those tasks and they're categorized, they assign an automation value to each of the tasks and then they aggregate that at the job level. And what this allows is it doesn't give a percentage of how likely an actual job is to be automated, it gives a percentage of tasks in a job that are going to be automated. And that, that's very helpful because you can begin to compare individual jobs with the same title against each other. So two doctors in the same hospital, you can tell how likely each of their two jobs are to be automated, but you can also compare doctors in one hospital to another one across the country or even across the world. But the downside is you need to have very intricate data. There's few data sources out there that have the level of here are, here are employees and here are all the tasks that they do. So the last approach, and the one that the McKinsey paper did, and what is beginning to become a new approach, 
or I should say the new standard, is also breaking the occupation into subcategories. But instead of tasks, they look at it as the skills that are required to complete the tasks that are needed for that job. They then take those skills, they predict how likely they are to be automated, and then again aggregate that at the job level to be able to determine the overall likelihood that the job is going to be automated. What's great about this approach and why it's beginning to shift towards this is because there's a whole separate field that's suggesting that there are some skills that humans enjoy doing better. Think about creative or social emotional skills. People that have jobs that utilize those skills generally tend to enjoy those jobs much more than people that use their physical skills or use routine sort of um, analytical skills. And so it's allowing us to look at this automation process in a new light. What's positive about this is that it can be calculated at the individual job level if that data exists, but it also can be at the occupation level. But the downside is that this is a new way to approach it and skills don't have the best definition for, or skills themselves don't have the best definition, let alone how likely they are to be automated. So a quick recap, there's two camps that really are, are, have come with automation. You have the occupation approach on one side and you have the task and skill based approach on the other. In the former, they view occupations as being holistic entities. Either they are automatable or they're not automatable. But in the latter camp, they believe that parts of a job can be automated, leading to better, more enjoyable work. With occupation-based approach, they believe that once your job is gone, you need to go find a brand new job. It, it's, there it's eliminated, similar to an outsourcing. But with the task and skill-based approach, people can change and it can lead to better work. And so in a lot of ways, occupation-based approach looks at the, work, the future of work as a dip, dystopian way, that it's the end of work, where the task and skill-based approach looks at the utopian future of us all doing jobs alongside robots and computers that we ourselves will enjoy more, will utilize our human skills. So in the end, who should fear automation? Well, really, those who have routine, a lot of routine, skill, routine tasks in their job are the most likely to be automated. And that pretty much everyone accepts. Also those who believe in the occupation approach because that approach is leading more towards the dystopian future where the people that believe that the this, this skill and task is leading towards a better future. But above all, it's the people who are afraid to change. Because no matter what, automation is here and it is changing the labor market and we ourselves are going to have to change with computers and with technology to adapt with the future of work. So with that, thank you very much.